ever. And I was about to mention that we received a few messages from people who couldn't make it. And thus, we're going to be recording this, uh, especially for AR teams. You're welcome. You're going to be welcome to share this uh, with your teammates and the like. Um, before I get going here, I'd like to do a special thank you to the other members of the Ontario board who have helped out with this open house. Uh, it's really great that everyone kind of jumped in and, and helped us out. We have a, we're really, really pleased with the turnout uh, and really look forward to getting to know some of you people new to the sport. Um, I've been involved with orienteering and adventure racing for a long time, and it's awesome that I barely knew anyone on the invite list. And that was something that uh, most of us said, looking looking at the people here. And this is really great uh, to see people interested in getting out in the woods. That's the whole running in the woods is something that uh, certainly I've loved my entire life, uh, growing up with with parents that were runners. Um, and it's something that we would love to get more people in, interested in our sports. Uh, I've been doing orienteering all my life, but I've also have done a number of adventure runs. Um, I always say Raid the Hammer put on by Don't Get Lost is my favorite race of the year. And a lot of that is being able to race with teammates. Uh, our two sports share so much in common and have such crossover that we wanted to cover both of these here tonight. Um, we're not so much interested in terms of what the labels use for various types of races. All we're interested in is people having a lot of fun in the, in the woods, uh, competitive aspects, and just enjoying being out in the nature. Um, this can be done in the wild of the Canadian Shield. It can be done in downtown Toronto on a sprint map, um, anything like that. And especially uh, coming out of COVID, I found that there was a real desire for people to wanting to get out into the woods. Uh, and that's something that I think our clubs have really embraced. Our race directors have really noticed uh, an increase in demand for spots. And it's something that we're really looking to build on. Uh, so with that, I'd like to get into our two guest speakers. Um, first of all, Mr. Bob Miller. You often hear people need no introduction and then people give a really long introduction. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, okay, quickly with the deck here, this is our, our basically agenda tonight. Um, also wanted to say the whole this whole event, uh, Open House, is a conversation. So if you have uh, questions or comments, you're welcome to put that in the chat as well. Uh, so getting on to our keynote interviews. Mr. Bob Miller, there is his introduction, so I don't have to read all this. Uh, but he, when they create a Canadian Adventure Racing Hall of Fame, Mr. Miller will be in it for sure. Uh, you may recognize him from his uh, TV appearances on the world's toughest race in uh, Eco Challenge in Fiji, where his team, he captained his team to a second place finish. He's the race organizer for races like Wilderness Traverse uh, and numerous other ones, um, and a veteran racer organizer. I think more than anything, just a really great ambassador for the sport. Uh, for someone who's raced at his life, high level, Bob's always been really approachable. He's a really great instructor and someone that uh, other teams can come up and ask him for advice. So thanks so much, Bob, for, uh, for talking about adventure racing here. And also, um, is Jennifer Anderson. Uh, Jenny's super well known in the National Capital Region. Uh, as a orienteer, former president of the or Auto Orienteering Club, she, uh, like myself, she had parents. She has parents really active in the sport. Uh, president of Orienteering Ottawa, currently on the Ontario or Orienteering Quebec board. She's getting involved with race organizing. I think more than anything, she's a real great ambassador for the sport. Um, people know that she's someone that they can ask questions about of the sport and getting into it, and also super active in trail running. Uh, mountain biking, paddling, and uh, anything around the Gatineau Park where she lives right on the edge there. So as I said, we're going to uh, have a little conversation about orienteering, about adventure racing, and looking to answer any questions that uh, people might have. So both of you, I'll start this off, start with Bob and then Jenny. Tell me a little bit about your sport background. I covered a little bit, but um, were you doing any kind of sports before AR and orienteering? And what else do you enjoy doing right now? So Bob first, then Jenny. Yeah, sure. Uh, I grew up uh, like normal um, team sports, hockey, baseball, soccer, that kind of thing. 
I didn't get into endurance sports until after university, um, kind of on a lark with a friend, we decided to run a marathon. Um, and that was my introduction to endurance. Um, but I also uh, took an outdoor ed program in high school. Um, and that kind of opened my eyes to the outdoors and canoe tripping and, and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I actually, we did a little bit of orienteering in the outdoor ed program, but that would have been my first introduction. And then uh, basically it, for me, it was um, learning to navigate for adventure racing is what brought me to orienteering um, in the first place. Cool, excellent. Uh, Jenny, what about for you? What, what, uh, what's your sport background and what else do you enjoy doing? Yeah, so grew up orienteering. Uh, my parents got my brother and I into the sport um, from the time we could be carried around a course. And uh, they're still very active in the sport. They're still competing. Um, I know they're looking forward to uh, championships coming up this summer. Um, other than orienteering, though, we were pretty big into skiing. So I'm still doing a lot of cross country skiing. Uh, I do a lot of mountain biking and yeah, definitely more of the endurance type sports. I've done a few multi-sport races, um, Raid the Hammer. It's a good uh, adventure race. I've, I've done that one and looking forward maybe to next year to doing it again. But um, yeah, my, uh, my parents definitely had a big role in, uh, in getting me into the sports that I'm still in today. Great. Um, kind of a big picture question. So when we were growing up, there was all this idea that, well, orienteering is a sport for life and adventure racing, you see people of all ages, but there's a lot of sports that people can do outside. There's trail running, there's uh, lots of paddling and that sort of thing. So to each of you, why do you kind of put your energy into adventure racing and orienteering? Why, why those sports and not some of these other um, potential activities outside? So maybe Jenny first and then to Bob on that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, what I think is the most special thing about orienteering is that it's just, it's just, just as much endurance uh, running, like the physical component as the mental component. So we always joke, you, can't, you don't want to outrun your brain. So your navigation has to be as good as uh, your speed. And I also often will tell people who, if you're new to the sport and trying to figure out this whole, uh, you know, how fast should I be going? Um, I, I often tell them about my dad and I, so my dad is, uh, as I say, still competing, but he'll go out and he'll hike a course, but his navigation is dead on. He is so accurate navigating where I'll do the same course running and will be fairly evenly matched. So it's a really interesting sport in that you can really make it what you want. Um, you can take it a bit slow and focus on navigation, or you can run your legs off and try to have your brain keep up and, and be more competitive. But it's really just that sort of uniqueness that that keeps me in it. It's the the technical and and the endurance too. It's a good mix. What about you, for What about you, Bob? Yeah, for for me, when I got started, um, it, basically adventure racing combined everything I loved about sport and the outdoors um, and also teamwork. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I was participating in, in team sports and then got into some outdoors, you know, canoe tripping and whatnot. Um, and then the competition that, that comes along with, with the events is what really drew it to me. And it kind of brought all these, these aspects that I really enjoyed um, together. Um, and then of course, th there's the exploration side where you're just, you know, seeing places you'd never otherwise see, um, if not for these events. And really, you're almost being given a, a tour uh, of a very special place in the world, wherever it may be, um, by like a local. Um, so that's kind of what, what drew me to it and keeps me coming back. Um, with that being said, probably my favorite discipline in adventure racing has become orienteering um <laughs> so it's kind of funny i love uh how much there is to learn with that sport um and yeah always looking to improve so um it's it's quite neat to cross over great um you mentioned jenny i think you mentioned briefly in terms of your family background but just for for both of you is this kind of solo sport that you do or are your families involved uh, Jen, you mentioned your, your parents, Bob, what about you? 
Uh, yeah, my wife races. Uh, we met at actually a, a snowshoe raid. <laughs> it's where we met. Um, and she races at, at a pretty good level. Um, and we have young boys, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if they get into it. <laughs> I like uh, what Jenny describes as her parents uh, bringing her to the races and the fact that she's still involved. Um, I'd be pretty happy if that worked out for our family as well. And Jen, what about in the Ottawa scene? Can you describe kind of the family aspect of things? Yeah, I'm thrilled that there's so many uh, families that are involved in the sport in, in Ottawa, Gatineau area. So we see new families every year that come out. Um, it is, it, it, my, we're all very happy <laughs> that my brother and I are still in the sport and it was not always the case when we were younger. Um, but, uh, my brother for a number of years is on the national team. It's really cool when everyone stays involved because we still will travel together, um, to different areas and, uh, but yeah, in Ottawa, tons of families, uh, we do every year in the spring, we call it a family fun day out at. Penny's Point if anyone's familiar with Penny's Point and that's um, a day of like little mini courses and puzzles and different activities based around orienteering so that always gets a lot of newcomers out as well and right. uh, but yeah it's uh, you can do a course with your family um, if kids are old enough you can send them out in a little team or on their own if they're comfortable uh, but uh, but yeah it's really it's what you choose okay let's get into training um, so both of you do many uh, other sports, and I think I'm sure that cross training is great for both of those. Um, let's talk in terms of getting into navigation based sport. What would you say in terms of the best approach to, to trying out an adventure race or to an orienteering? Bob, I'll turn to you first in terms of if someone wanted to race an adventure race with navigation this year, what would you recommend they, they do? And uh, then Jen, over to you in terms of what should they be focusing on as someone is learning how to navigate? Yeah, for, for getting in, really the best way is just to jump in, um, find some friends that are willing and able and um, collect some gear. It doesn't have to be the best gear and, and honestly uh, jump into the race and, and give it a go. You'll learn more trying an event than you would probably in months um, of trying to read and learn and prepare. Um, so yeah, pick an easier event, jump in, um, give it a go. Um, there's so much involved once you get into the sport with respect to training and there's the endurance side and then the technical aspects and all the, the skills involved, but uh, really you just got to see it firsthand. And if, if you're not quite there, you don't want to you know, jump right into an event, you can always come and volunteer. Um, there's tons of volunteer roles, and then you'll get a, a first hand glimpse of kind of what's going on as well. Do uh, either of you still get lost in the woods? <laughs> or All maybe the time. Just, yeah, okay. <laughs> Jen, maybe uh, describe in terms of uh, as someone's getting in, well, like, is it okay to be lost at an event? And um, what would be the first to show up at an, at an orienteering event, say a small local one, kind of walk through how that would uh, that would go and what should they be thinking about as they, they get their map and their course for the first time? Yeah, yeah, just try not to get lost getting to the event site because people will not let you uh, live that one down. Um, but no, everyone will get lost at some point. Uh, it's just about getting quicker and quicker at relocating. But uh, yeah, so the first, uh, at, at a first event, well, like Bob said, come out, give it a try, ask questions. Orienteers are lovely people. We always want to chit chat about orienteering pre and post race, uh, but route choice and whatever. So first of all, come on out, don't be intimidated. And then um, also in, in advance of that, like talking about what to do for navigation practice, any opportunity you can to, to use a paper map, or any map that's not going to orient itself for you, uh, give it a go. Like if you are on a paddling trip, bring a paper map with you. If you're, uh, I was telling someone, some kids, like if you're stuck at the bus stop, use the bus map. Any opportunity you have to use a map is going to help your spatial sense and in, in turn will help with uh, with navigation. Um, but yeah, at the event site, um, sorry, was the question how to how to get going at an event, like a local or event? Or kind of when you're thinking about navigating, big picture navigation, 
uh, yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, yeah, you, you're probably going to start off pretty simple. So at our Ottawa events, anyway, the local events, there's always a, a choice of course. So there's a novice course you can start with. And that type of navigation, um, you're mostly going to be on trails. So you'll start off pretty simple. Don't need a compass. Always map first. Compass will come later. You're going to be navigating off big major features like trail intersections or boulders or buildings. Um, and then when it gets a little bit more complicated, when you're more off the trail on harder courses, this is where you're going to be using a compass more. So maybe it'll be just to orient the map back um, to correct, or maybe you're going to start taking bearings. And in orienteering, they're often uh, short bearings between features, and uh, and it gets fancier, it gets trickier from there. We also have navigation clinics too. So if you're uh, near an orienteering club give them a shout and see if they've got any clinics going on. Cause I know, especially early season for us, we've got a number of things on the calendar for just navigation focused. Right, just a little bit on compass. We often hear someone say, oh, you do orienteering or adventure racing. Oh, it's all about the compass. Um, I look at compasses as, as the tool that you use, but when you think compass versus map, what are you using more? Yeah, the map, map first, it's always map first. Orienteering maps are the most detailed map you'll see of, of that given area. So um, one to 5,000 scale, maybe even larger scale if it's a sprint or if it's a training activity, but everything that's permanent should be on the map. Um, so you've got, you have a ton of information to use to orient yourself. And then the compass is coming later. And as mentioned, it's maybe just to simply reorient your map to north. Uh, or maybe you're getting into some bearing stuff. And you don't have to have a fancy compass. So if you're trying orienteering this time, this year for the first time, maybe if you have an old base plate compass, uh, bring it along. It doesn't have to have a sighting mirror. Orienteering maps are always already oriented to magnetic north. So you don't have to have a declination ring on it or anything, nothing fancy. Uh, the more you're into the sport, the more competitive you get, you might want to get a thumb compass. Um, and these are fancier compasses, They're not fancier, but uh, more suitable to the sport because you can hold it at the same time as your map. Bob, talk a bit in terms of just the compass in, in uh, just a little little bit in terms of what Jenny talked about in terms of navigating, using the map, using the compass as backup and, and making sure you're in the right direction. Does that work in terms of whether you're doing a short orienteering race and a mega long eco challenge? Is it the same fundamentals uh, behind both? Uh we we would probably use the compass a lot more um just because the maps that we get often in adventure races aren't as beautiful as an orienteering map with everything detailed and on there we're often dealing with maps that might have been made in the 70s or 80s um, they're generally one to fifty thousand scale for the longer distances that we're covering um and yeah they haven't been updated um, but you also might end up, so because of that, you, you get into terrain that's a little bit featureless, um, and you have to pick very big features kind of on either end of an area that you might be trying to get through. Um, and in those instances, we're using compasses and following a compass bearing quite a bit. Um, so that, 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 that actually is a big difference between orienteering and some of the adventure racing navigation you'll do is that we will rely on our compasses. There could be, you know, anywhere from in wilderness traverse, for example, you could have anywhere from two to five kilometers where you might be just following a bearing through pretty featureless, um, forested terrain. Um, but again, you'd have very big catch catchment features on either end either a road or a big lake or, or something that's gonna be obvious. So um, that I would say is, is probably a pretty big difference. And by features, examples of that would be like a boulder, a hilltop of some sort, a creek, that kind of stuff? Yeah, exactly. Um, on those older one to 50,000 scale maps, you just don't have the detail of those smaller features. Um, and in some instances, there's incorrect information on them um, with respect to how the marshes might have changed and if a beaver dam's gone up in an area and it hasn't made it to the map yet. So just just funny things like that. And Jen, that, that's a big difference, I'd say, between uh, adventure racing in which everyone has the same map and everyone has to deal whether it's very good or very bad. 
Um, Jen, you briefly mentioned in terms of the quality of our orienteering map. Can you discuss in terms of the background on that? Yeah, so the maps are really are, aside from uh, landowner relationships, these are like our biggest resources. The maps take a long time to produce. Uh, usually they're done by volunteers in the club, but we do often, or we do sometimes hire um, foreign mappers or local mappers to do them. And yeah, they're very specialized maps. So again, one to 5,000, 7,500, uh, typically for a, a weekend event, maybe one to 10,000 scale maps, a little bit smaller. Um, but yeah, there's tons of information on them. So something as obvious as uh, a big field or a big building or road intersection and something as, as fine detail as uh, uh, a pit or a shallow re-entrant. A re-entrant is like a little valley. Um, so they get very, very detailed. And it's fascinating too, when you look at maps from around the world, um, it's really, uh, it's a fun activity. Again, again, just looking at maps from, at any opportunity you get um, is great training and, and it's just you, fun. And, and on that, on this training section, uh, during COVID, we saw a rapid um, introduction of map run, something called map run F. And uh, exactly what is that? And um, there's some just, there's some questions about getting maps. We'll get to that in one second on the chat there. But Jen, can you cover what is Map Run F and how do clubs use that? And is that a training option potentially, depending on what the courses are? Yeah. So I won't have all the technical answers. Um, but Map Run F uh, is something that we used. We're still using it for training, but basically it allowed us to go out to an area that we had already mapped, but the, uh, the locations, the control spots were virtual. So you could run or walk or hike a course with a cell phone with an application on it. And when you were in the vicinity of a virtual control, you'd get a little beep on your phone and it would collect it just as you would in a regular orienteering event, show up with what we call an SI, a sport ident to register that you've found the control. Um, and so then, and it was pretty seamless then uploading it to uh, Strava or whatever, um, attack point, whatever um, online uh, training, uh, whatever app that you use. Um, but this was really, it was amazing for during COVID when we couldn't congregate in the same area, people could go and do it on their own time. We also have schools that are using it. So we're helping uh, set up courses for different schools in the region. And uh, as long as one person has a cell phone, then uh, it works super well. Cool. Uh, that's great. And it's been really interesting to see that uh, during COVID, when I was living in Ottawa, I went out and ran my first map run F course. Uh, and it was it was really, well, a first really fun to be back in the woods. Uh, and then really interesting to, that you could run. There was not an actual control there. But when you're in the right location, your phone would beep and uh, you knew you'd made it. So it's a it's a way that the clubs are introducing technology. Um, there's questions in terms of getting uh, practice maps. Um, the best answer for that is always contact a uh, local orienteering club uh, and you'll have a conversation for them. Some of these maps are of uh, public areas, some of them are private uh, and always ask permission uh, before going out and using it. It's really, really important. We'll get into this later in terms of land access, but uh, that's becoming more and more of an important issue. Um, quick question about navigating, Bob. Are you the only navigator on your race teams? If a, if a team was looking to race this summer, should they put all their eggs into one kind of saying, one person say, lead us on? Or uh, do you split navigating? Do you recommend more people than one in the, on the team know what they're doing? I would say it's always beneficial to have more experienced navigators on the team. Um, then you can kind of talk when things don't go to plan and, and figure out a little bit easier as opposed to just having one person's insights um, that you're relying on. Um, so yeah, definitely better to have more than one person uh, that can navigate. Um, then there's also the side where, you know, it comes down to speed and if you're, you know, 
having a committee about every decision, it can eat up a lot of time, um, which isn't great also. So usually there's a lead navigator for a given section or at a given time, and they're kind of calling the shots. And then um, if they need help, they'll reach out to their teammates, but um, good navigators will keep their teammates involved as well. Um, kind of always explaining what's coming up, what they've been through, what to, ex what to expect, when's the next turn, what we're looking for. And then teammates can be very helpful too. They might hear a creek in the forest somewhere and, oh, is that on the map? Or, you know, maybe they see something somewhere else that they just caught a glimpse of through a forest or off in a direction and that can help your navigator quite a bit. So having everyone involved um, is, is quite important and it's very helpful. Great. Um, Bob, question we had in the chat here about physical training and how do you break out how you train for a racing season, uh, different sports? Um, do you focus on one more than another? Uh, and uh, how much do you work on peaking as well? Um, and Jen, maybe as a follow-up question, uh, in terms of orienteering and fitness, um, is there something that uh, kind of runners need to think about when they're going through the woods versus uh, on a track or on a road? So Bob, first. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, uh, it comes down to the endurance side is is – well laid out in many books and you know there's tons of literature on it you could probably find freely online but basically it's the periodization model where you're doing a lot of longer slower distances early on building the base as as it's called and then you progress into more challenging but shorter workouts of you know maybe running hills or biking hills or paddling intervals whatever it may be and then yeah the goal is to peak for your event, which would then involve a taper of some form where you're reducing your, your training for a few weeks before the event. Um, as far as like, how much time do you spend on each discipline? Um, I think people are creatures of habit and they'll tend to do what they like to do best. <laughs> so if you're a good runner and you enjoy running, you're probably going to run more. Um, so really for adventure racing, it's getting outside and having fun and doing fun things. So if you like to do one thing more than the other, I'd say, say go for it. But when we were training for like some of the high level events, we're going to try and do anywhere between two and four workouts a week in a give in each discipline. That's going to be big for that race. Um, and then building up through that periodization method. Um, in addition to gaining other random skills they might throw in whether it's rappelling or rope work or white water or riding horses or whatever crazy thing someone's dreamed up and jen what about uh for orienteering versus a, a road runner um yeah i guess you just have to expect expect the unexpected you have to be prepared to be running or or walking or hiking um through really varied terrain so you could be going through swamps uh, you might be on the trail most of the time. You could be going through a lot of underbrush, but all of these things are going to be on the map. So if you don't want to go through the underbrush, maybe take the trail, even if it's a bit longer. So that's where it becomes really fun with route choice. So I don't want to cross the swamp. I'll go around it, but it would have been maybe quicker to go through the swamp. So it's, uh, this is all part of the fun of, of route choice, but it's good to be prepared. Good trail runners um, are a good idea. Your feet are going to get wet. Um, and other like compared to like a road running, I guess being maybe a little bit more agile on your feet, just making sure you're picking up your knees if you're through uh, some underbrush or rocky terrain. But yeah, expect the unexpected. I thought one of you would have told uh, told everyone to do a lot more core strength. Uh, so I'm glad you didn't because I did none over the winter. So that makes me feel better. Um, Bob, gear question. Do you have to have the latest and greatest of all gear jumping into adventure racing? Uh, what, are, what kind of recommendations around that for multi-sport? Uh, no, definitely not. Um, pretty much you're going to need a mountain bike with a minimum of front suspension. Um, but there's tons of those out there and even the older ones. I mean, people were racing in the 90s on those old bikes and they still got them through some some pretty amazing terrain. So 
Um, but yeah, that's the big thing is the bike, some trail runners, as Jenny was talking about. Um, and then probably just a little, maybe a PFD, like some paddling gear. And then there's some clothing that's required. You're going to want some, you know, wicking under layers and some waterproof outer layers. Um, but really, if you're trying to keep it simple, it's not that overly um, difficult to find these things. From working in outdoor stores, I always recommend uh, buy fancy socks. Uh, you will, you'll kind of be like, ah, do I really want to pay that much in socks? And you will thank yourself later. Uh, Jan, any comment in terms of I don't want to say orienteering fashion, but uh, what do people wear? What what should they um, think about wearing? Does it have to be 20 years old or can you wear something that's uh, that's newish out to orienteering? Um, you can wear whatever kind of outfit you're comfortable running in the woods in. So a lot of orienteers will choose uh, technical fibers. Ripstop nylon is popular. So again, if you're going through underbrush or uh, raspberry bushes hopefully not um you're you're not going to end the course with completely shredded pants so ripstop nylon is great but really any technical fiber that you're comfortable in uh long pants though or at least longer pants with gaiters or tall socks is a good idea so that you're not totally scratched up by the end um this doesn't really apply to if you're doing a an easier or novice course on the trails but once you're off trail you definitely want to consider what you're wearing up it does not have to be fancy and it's probably not going to be fashionable. <laughs> and uh, getting it, we talked about compasses earlier. Uh, you said it doesn't have to be fancy as, as well, getting into it. Anywhere you'd recommend if people are looking for a non, uh, a non ranger style compass. A non base plate compass, like a thumb compass? No, no a non mirrored uh, ranger style. Um, number of different sports stores i don't i'm not completely up to date on on where like a simple base plate company maybe like mountain equipment in ottawa there's uh uh sale I, believe, I don't know if that's i believe there's an online store called the o store uh based I in ottawa i was gonna come to this yes o store <laughs> yeah gotta plug o store o dash store.ca i think it is um and they have an excellent selection of thumb compasses as well any orienteering gear that you need can be found on OSTOR. Yes. Yeah. Great. What are what are some of the big events uh, that either of you are looking forward to? Bob, you're you're putting on a few, so maybe you can mention some of those and and Jen, uh, some that you're looking at as well. Um, I was actually just on the World Row Gaining Championship website today, looking at. Um, the races down in California and those were looking pretty fun. So <laughs> I'll jump in here. The, the historically there was a term for um, long at one point, 24 hour races that were started by weird Australians and they called them row gains. It's not a term that we're using anymore, but uh, they're using it as a 24 hour race in California this summer in is it July. It's mid July in uh in tahoe area and it's some of the most absolutely spectacular uh woods i've seen in north america people like just rave about the woods down there um so bob are you are you considering racing that uh, i was just looking at it i mean it, it fits in with my summer schedule potentially and when we had planned some vacation so we're researching right now <laughs> so Excellent. It, it'd be awesome if it worked out Yep, and some of the ones that you're organizing? Yeah, so I've taken over the Storm Adventure Race, which is kind of like Ontario's um, great event for newcomers to experienced racers. Um, it's where a lot of people got started in adventure racing, and that's May 27th, 28th weekend. Um, the Bruce Peninsula Multi Sport Race is also a great entry level race. Um, that's in August. Uh, I help organize that event. It's uh, actually a no navigation race, so the courses are completely marked. Um, that's a good one. And then the longer uh, um, adventure race I organize is called Wilderness Traverse at the end of September. And as you mentioned, that's a 24 hour adventure race, um, likely one of the more challenging races in kind of Canada or Eastern North America um, when it comes to adventure racing. Um, but funny enough, back in the day, like 
there weren't shorter events around and a lot of us uh, had to jump in to at the very beginning you had to jump right into an expedition race <laughs> so it's all it's all relative um as far as that goes yeah it's interesting talking to some of the savvy veterans like those expedition races would take a long time to train for many days to race and you would and you'd be pretty destroyed. Uh, I remember look, guys like John Marquez and Doug Mahoney in, in really rough shape the, the days after that versus now, I guess they must feel like a sprint to go and do a, a race that's only one day, but um, you at least show up to work the next day. Yeah, yeah. The shorter events are great. And that's, that's how I got started um, about 20 years ago was in the, and it's funny, we call them shorter races, but they're still, you know, absolutely. To, six to eight hours it's still a very long <laughs> long race when you compare it to like an Ironman or you know any of these other uh, endurance sports so uh, absolutely kind of when I'm racing raid the hammer it doesn't feel short <laughs> at that no. point uh Jen how about to yourself um what races or events of any sort that you're uh you're looking at yeah so uh the club is gearing up for our spring spring series so sunday local events all across the region and then we're also hosting what we call ofest which is sort of like our, our club championships uh but this year it's being run in conjunction with the canadian orienteering championships and that's in august beginning of august uh so we're partnering up with uh, the montreal clubs and the events are going to be uh all over the place between uh Feralton, quebec if you know that area all the way through to uh rawdon area um, around Montreal. So it's, uh, I think, 10, 10 days of, of orienteering and different uh, training activities and all kinds of stuff going on. It's a, it's a festival. Sorry. I'll We're calling have it to give a, a great plug for the Ottawa Club. Uh, one of the reasons Jen's here, the Ottawa Club, their Sunday event series is probably the best in North America. Uh, every single event that they put on in the spring and fall, really, really high quality maps and courses and totally worth a road trip if you're not near the Ottawa area. They're really, really great to go to. And just the quality is incredibly good um, for someone getting into the sport. Uh, Jen, that's you live by Gatineau Park. What about people like me who live downtown a big city? Uh, how, how um, what's navigation in the city like? Are there orienteering events in the city? And um, is that something that would improve and help your, uh, your forest navigation? Yes, yes and yes. So we also do urban orienteering. So urban, uh, also known as sprint events or courses. These are uh, on roads and paths through uh, city parks. Um, so much different terrain than a typical or, or maybe more traditional orienteering course. And uh, so the, the distance, the course is shorter. The distance between the control points is, is shorter, so they come up quicker. Uh, so anywhere typically between maybe two kilometers and say six or seven kilometers. Um, you might want to correct me on that. But yeah, urban orienteering or sprint orienteering is uh, definitely popular and, and getting more so. Bob, you must have race, done some racing that suddenly you're going through urban terrain. For, for me, I sometimes find that I tend to kind of slow down my navigation because I'm thinking it's easy. Is that something that uh, good AR people have to watch out for in terms of thinking that this is not going to be that challenging? Uh, one of the places I used to get lost the most was in the underground in Toronto. So <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I, I used to work in Toronto as well, um, and I've trained in a lot of the parks and ravines and waterfront and whatnot around there, and, and you can do fantastic training, um, especially it seems the cities in Canada um, have a lot of green space and valleys and ravines and, and things like that, so um, it's definitely easy, and as Jenny mentioned earlier, anytime you have a map in your hand um, and you're not using your phone or a GPS in your car, um, it's invaluable. So the more you can do that, the better. We're coming up to the end of this. So any, if you have questions that we haven't covered, please put them in the chat. Uh, Jen, often, or we mostly see orienteering as a solo event, AR as a, as a team event. Are there team events in orienteering? Is there anything stopping someone from showing up on a Sunday event with two people wanting to do a course or anything like that? 
No, you can definitely grow it as a team. So we have a lot of families. We have uh, newcomers that want to pair up with other people, or we have actually, well, I'll use myself as an example. So I went, uh, most of the courses this fall, I did as a little team, myself and my husband and my, at the time, two month old. So we were a, a little team of three out in the forest. So anyone can show up and do it as a team. That's no problem. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, so Rogaining, I guess we're not calling it Rogaining anymore. Uh, I was not up to date on that, but that's definitely more of a team sport, but yeah, Sunday events for sure. If you want to do it as a team, that's totally cool. Excellent. And, um, you mentioned uh, people probably were being beaten by your two month old. Uh, for both Bob and Jen, what's the kind of age range? Um, like if someone shows up and they're a really, say they're a low 30s, 10K runner or something, mid 30s, um, should they expect to win? Uh, if someone is a slow runner, should they do they have no chance? Um, maybe Bob, in terms of what are you seeing for age of racers? Uh, and is this something that, um, people can grow into? Um, in adventure races, we're, we're seeing actually all range storm, the storm adventure race. Uh, we have really young kids racing with their parents. Maybe their parents were involved early on, similar to the orienteering community. Um, so yeah, we're seeing like eight, nine, 10 year old racing with their, their parents. Um, and then I know we've had um some older finishers at the longer wilderness traverse race in their late 60s um coming out to the race so it really runs the gamut of of age ranges and and who, who can participate at the end of the at the end of the day it's about getting outside having fun with friends or family um having a fun experience and then chatting with with everyone at, afterwards about i mean both of these sports are similar in that you know, no one has the same story to tell at the end of the race because they've all experienced something different, which is kind of a unique and cool thing um, post-race to, to chat about. Great. Jen, what about uh, in terms of age and speed uh, versus navigating? Yeah, so one of the coolest things about orienteering in the last few years, uh, the uh, Orienteering Canada, which is our, the National Federation, they introduced a competitive 90 year old category. So we have men and women now in their nineties who are competing uh, at big events, at major events. I think that's amazing. Um, but yeah, it, like Bob said, everyone's got a different story to tell when you finish the course. So if you're, if you show up as a, a super, super fast runner, um, but haven't maybe done the training needed for, for navigation, don't expect to do much better than someone who maybe is, uh, has been working on their navigation, but could be a little bit slower. It's really a very fine balance between the two to be a really good orienteer. And I think last no thing was age. circle back on fitness. Um, I think one of the things that we very much underplay, uh, in orienteering is the physical fitness and, and how tough it is. Um, you know, I've heard it compared or said like it's an organic adventure, uh, uh, organic obstacle course sometimes out there. And uh, can you either of you comment, Bob or Bob and Jen, in terms of like just how's your body feel after a really hard race uh, versus I know, Bob, you've you've certainly helped organize some obstacle races and that kind of thing. I always say that like after an M21 race, I am beat up, I'm sore and uh, it's a great, great workout. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, especially if you're not uh, used to running through the woods for extended periods of time or over rocky and gnarly terrain. Again, it, it depends where the event's hosted. Um, and this gets back to training. There's lots of things you can do to prepare for these things. Um, one of my favorite workouts is riverbed running um if you, if you find a dry riverbed that's you know full of rocks start by you know hiking up and down that and then try jogging or running over that type of terrain um and just getting those muscles firing that are used to you know more technical terrain will help you um in those more challenging events but 100 percent at the end of every raid the hammer or rib raid or whatever it is long orienteering race um yeah you're usually feeling pretty beat up excellent uh there was a comment there from uh, jim about kingston and uh yes ottawa has plans there so 
Jim, you should reach out to the Ottawa Club and they would love to chat. I've come pretty much to the end of the question of my questions, and I don't see anything more that we haven't covered there in um, in the chat there. So, Bob, Jen, any last uh, comments, and we'll keep going through our open house. Bob, first. Um, yeah, if, if you're new, just get out, try an event, um, and have fun with it. Don't take it too seriously. Um, that's a problem we see sometimes. Um, but yeah, just start, start small, have fun, get some friends, um, and enjoy yourself. Excellent. And Jen, and I want to say to everyone, don't leave. We've got more stuff after this. We're just saying thank you to Jen and Bob. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Bob said. Just come on out, give it a try, contact your local club um give us at ottawa a shout if you want to know anything about uh the august events there are some uh, i'm just looking at the bulletin here events closer down uh kingston way maybe this summer anyway give us a shout i i know i'm biased but i like to think that orienteers are very friendly people uh, i think all of uh, you who orienteer would agree um come out and have a chat ask for help join a clinic bring your friends and then most importantly stay after the event and have a post-race chat because it's always fun to compare maps for uh, just, yeah, anytime you can be chit-chatting about maps is a good time. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Uh, you're welcome. Please do stay on the line as we go through the rest of the segment here. Uh, and for those of you who, you know, you come up with a great question uh, later or really interested, then please reach out to Orienteering Ontario. We're happy to uh, to ask these two a question or try to answer it ourselves. So thanks, uh, thanks Bob and Jen, and we'll see you guys both in the woods. Uh, if we can have the PowerPoint set up again, there we go. And uh, I will turn it over from Stars Orienteering Club uh, to Laura Smith. Turn the floor over to you. Laura was on the Ontario board for many many years. We still haven't replaced her. Haven't come close. Uh, she's going to do really quickly just a, a quick overcap of the Ontario Cup uh, season, please. Laura? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thanks so much, Nevin. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to give a quick overview of our winter race series that just, just ended. Um, we have a great annual winter race series that gives a great excuse to get out into the snow, as you can see on this fantastic picture here. Um, and it's a kind of a neat format in that it's a it's a shorter race, usually about an hour, maybe less if you if you know what you're doing and are fast enough. But there's a great um, handicap system um, in it. And so what happens is uh, based on your age and your your sex, you get to drop a certain number of controls. And so the idea is that anybody who races this race has a chance chance to uh, to win it. And it does happen. We have you never know who's going to win the race. Um, and this year was our first return to full schedule, which was fantastic since probably 20, 2018, 2019 season. Um, we had six races. And uh, as you can see there in the, in the list um, across the GTA. And uh, we also, so the other great thing about the Oak Cup that makes it very competitive and a lot of fun. Um, yeah, Eugene just mentioned TOC pulled out three races this season, which was unbelievable. Um, but anyway, the best thing about the O Cup series is that we award points, and so it becomes quite a fun, competitive social event. Um, depending on your on your placing, you get you get so many points, and they get added up. And so, at the end of the season, we award prizes to our overall winner, and um, and also, um, and I think he's on the call. Is he here? There, there. That's a great picture. So Andrew McLaren, um, who's from the Foothills Orienteering Club in Alberta and currently um, also racing for Don't Get Lost in Hamilton and also on Team Canada. Um, Andrew was our overall uh, uh, winner of the O-Cup this season. And I think he's on the call, is he? He was here earlier. Yeah, hi. Are you there, Andrew? Hi, Andrew. Do you have the trophy by chance? Uh, no, I gave it to Emil because he's going to be doing some uh, updates to it. Oh, too bad, okay. The, the Oak Cup has a fantastic trophy that's been around the block and has a lot of names on it. Um, so Andrew gets to keep it for the year. Um, and maybe he'll get to keep it next year, depending on how well he does. But uh, uh, Andrew, um, I think, Nevin, did you want to, Andrew, to make a few comments about his uh, training or? 
Sure. Andrew, um, you're on the national team. Talk about like doing these races during the winter to, to keep you fit and keep you thinking about uh, racing. How did you, how did you like them? Uh, yeah, I guess they're just uh, fun and uh, I guess good motivation for keeping up the speed throughout the winter. And then also, yeah, I guess it's always nice to have a bit more of an actual race to go to and uh, a reason to run a little harder every once in a while. And uh, yeah, I know it's always nice to get in some new areas and new maps. Well, since I've uh, just come to Ontario not too long ago, it's nice to explore all these different areas and uh, meet all these new people. Cool. This uh, picture here, this is you running uh, in Europe, I think. Or was it Europe, this picture? Or uh, not? You were that's racing in Washington. Okay, in Washington. Uh, you raced last year in Europe. Uh, if someone looks up Andrew McLaren, orienteering there's a good cbc article about his luggage barely arriving in time um what's your uh, race did not oh it did not arrive in time that's right uh you were just down racing u.s champs this weekend uh and what are what's your season looking like this year what big races are you focusing on uh yeah i guess so in terms of big races i guess up in may i have western canadian champs over in Kelowna. And then uh, throughout the summer, then there's Junior Worlds over in Romania, followed by North Americans down in Lake Tahoe. Again, kind of adjacent to the row gaining events we were previously talking about. And then shortly after that, there's the Canadian Champs events that we were also talking about over in Ottawa. And then uh, probably a few other more adventure racy type races throughout the fall, like Ray the Hammer and the usual stuff around there. But uh, Otherwise, that's about it. Great. Good stuff. And what uh, what do you do when you're not orienteering, Andrew? Um, studying software engineering at McMaster University. And then also, I guess, otherwise, various other outdoor stuff, camping, hiking, biking, all the usual. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. And Laura, back over to you. Sorry. Yeah, and we also want to give a shout out to uh, our other uh, winners of the OCAP. So our top adult female was Chris Kajanski from DTL, who I think she is holding up the, uh, she was holding up the the award that Andrew will receive eventually, um, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, and it, the top adult male was Emil Kajanski, also from DGL. And our junior and female, um, junior female and junior male are Leah and Isaac Franson, also from DGL. So clearly don't get lost, had a good, very good season in the win out there um for us but uh again by all means I mean I don't want to make it seem like you have to go to every race but by all means it's a great way to stay fit as Andrew said during the winter and a lot of fun excellent thank you so much Laura and thanks for all the work that you did on uh, on the O Cup this year we really appreciate it okay we'll move on to the next slide I'd like to turn the floor over to Emma Waddington uh, Emma's a member of Don't Get Lost in Team Canada, uh, where she races internationally for Canada, including at last year's World Games and World Champs. Uh, she's top-ranked North American woman, uh, graduate of the Adventure Racing uh, Kids Program, and also a member of the McMaster Cross-Country Running and Cross-Country Ski Teams. She also raced uh, Wilderness Traverse, uh, getting into the uh, adventure racing field. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Emma. Hey, Nevin. Thanks for that intro. Um, do you want me to just uh, get started here? Or maybe I'll give a little brief overview about what the heck I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm a graduate student at McMaster, and I'm really lucky to get to combine my research interests with my uh, sports interests. So later on in May, I'm going to be giving a webinar uh, with Orienteering Canada, um, way more in depth about my research. Today, we're going to get a little crash course sneak peek. So um, this is work that I published uh, from an undergraduate study that I did, um, and I'm now continuing it on in my uh, master's research. So here's the basis of what I'm interested in. It came from this idea that when we see severe aging, um, we see a lot of impairments in spatial memory, um, impairments in navigation, 
And in cases like Alzheimer's disease or dementia, we get something known as topographical disorientation. So this is when somebody um, is even in a familiar place that they know becomes completely turned around. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going, um, completely turned around. And this is due to the degeneration of a brain region called the hippocampus. So it's a paired structure in the brain, really deep in the middle there. Um, but what we see in severe aging, as well as dementia, this um, brain region takes a super hard hit compared to other brain regions. So our skills in memory and navigation tend to fail. Um, and they're also failing us because, uh, kind of like what Jenny said, anytime looking at a real paper map and not a self-guiding GPS app is good for us. We, we grew up saying, we grew up using maps and using spatial skills, and now we're not using them anymore. And our daily lives were also more sedentary. And exercise is really, really good at improving brain function. So if you see over here in my little graphic, we have a little dude running. So when we exercise, this releases something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So you can think of this kind of like a brain fertilizer. It fertilizes the brain, especially that hippocampus region. And with that fertilization, you kind of think of when you fertilize your grass, you get more grass um, and that becomes fuller. So those brain regions that um, support these cognitive functions like spatial memory become stronger. But if you see over here under my little map picture, there's a second pathway to improving cognitive function. And that is with that prolonged uh, active rehearsal of doing navigational tasks. So both of these tasks, when we do exercise combined with navigation, we have two pathways leading to the same end result in improving cognitive function, like orienteering or adventure racing. So in my study, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so in my study, what we wanted to see was if those who did orienteering um, had better spatial memory and better navigational skills than those who just did physical activity. So we recruited 158 or, uh, healthy older adults, 18 to 87 years old. So they were intermediate, advanced, or elite skill level and compared them to a physically active control group. We asked them a questionnaire that um, had them look at their um, their tendencies for doing spatial navigation tasks. And we saw that not only did they use navigational strategies that were more efficient, though they were using navigational strategies that we tend to not use as much as we go into further into the aging process. So they were using more efficient navigational skills. And then we also asked them their self-reported spatial memory um, perceptions. So what we saw, if you see over here on the right two bars, those with advanced or elite skill level in orienteering actually had better perceptions of their spatial memory compared to either controls or intermediate level orienteers. And these associations were found regardless of age, sex, or physical activity level, which kind of shows us that this active rehearsal of um, this navigational skill with exercise um, is really good for kind of prolonging those or, or staving off those cognitive declines that may come with age. So in the webinar I'm going to be giving in May, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this research, but also the research that I'm currently doing using orienteering as an actual intervention. So after one bout of orienteering and someone who's never done it before, what are the brain changes that we see? So not sure the date yet, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and hopefully we'll see you for the webinar. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emma. And uh, that that webinar is going to be co-presented from uh, Orienteering Ontario and Orienteering Canada because we wanted as a broader reach as possible and really, really interesting uh, work on that. Uh, there's been a, quite a few really interesting, uh, or this has been picked up by international media. Uh, we can share some links to that as well. So congrats, Emma. I uh, also wanted to do another shout out on that uh, in April, uh, also co-presented by Orienteering Ontario and Orienteering Canada. Uh, one of the other Waddingtons, uh, the less well known now, Mike Waddington, uh, Emma's father, who was one of the top uh, orienteers way back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Um, he's, Mike is going to be presenting on construction and deconstructing course setting. So that's going to be on uh, both that's going to be really useful for people who are adventure racing and orienteering 
looking at what the mind and uh, thoughts between of someone putting a course together. And as an athlete, it's really useful to learning about that um, in terms of how you attack a course as well. So thanks everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Emma, uh, for, for this and really looking forward to uh, your presentation later on and your father's as well will be great too. Okay, uh, moving on. Okay, uh, we are running tight for time, which is great because uh, meant the other folks talked quite a bit. We're gonna go through this quickly. Uh, I'm watching the chat. If there are questions uh, around these, then please jump in. And, uh, but we're gonna do a quick roundtable of our clubs uh, because our clubs are the ones that put on the events, really great events and are really the lifeblood to the sport here. So we're gonna start with Don't Get Lost, STARS, TOC, and Ottawa. We have some slides here, but uh, we're gonna give each club just a couple minutes. So please don't read everything off your slide. Uh, and uh, we'll start out um, with uh, the coolest Australian in, in Ontario, orienteering, who works for Hamilton, for works for uh, Don't Get Lost, Patrick Sale. I hope you're on the, the line. Uh, are you there? Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, that was a terrible intro and completely untrue. Um, but why don't we just, because we don't have a lot of time, let's go through to the events page. I think that's the best thing. And we'll just talk about like what's coming up this spring. There we go. Look at that. All right. Um, like we have a pretty big, almost a year round calendar right now. Uh, but what's up coming for us very soon. Um, you see, you can see Raid the Rib there. That's our next like we are got a very busy late late April. We have Raid the Rib, I want to say on the 23rd of April. So that's um, an adventure run. So it's just, it's not like a multi-sport race like we talked about, but it's a long orienteering race. Uh, this is one of these formats we call Choose Your Adventure or a score orienteering event, where you basically have three hours to get as many checkpoints and they're all worth different amount of points. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm talking about that now is... Um, I um we've actually got registration for this are very high already for this race. It's a very uh random almost the amount of entries we get from year to year. Some years we have 35 teams, some years we have 85. Um, but we're closing in on about 45 right now already before remotely getting close to late fees coming in. So that's exciting. Um, we're also it's not on there. We're also just four days earlier or three days earlier hosting the schools adventure challenge in Hamilton, uh, which is a local race that has a, usually around a thousand kids taking part. Um, that's also very exciting. Um, and one more thing I will talk about before we move on to something else for the spring. Uh, for everyone who who here is still listening and interested, it had was mentioned in all chat. But um, the, we do host navigation clinics. We have one coming up in April and one in May as well. Uh, I'm sure someone can put it, if they haven't put it in, all, in the chat already, they can put a link to the page. Uh, but Emil Gajanski, the winner of the Ontario uh, the O Cup season for the winter, is the, um, he uh, runs these, uh, these courses. So you're in very good hands if you are looking to learn. How's that? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Did you mention ARC or not? Uh, well, I should have because that's literally starting this week. Uh, we're starting our Adventure Running Kids program, which we've been running in the spring. We've been running for nearly 15 years. Uh, it's the reason why I started working with Don't Get Lost way back in 2010 and never left, um, even though the government tried a couple of times. Um, but yeah, so that is that runs for 10 weeks in the spring and the fall. It's for kids age six and up. Um, look at, and I, I just saw what Emma put in the in the chat. She's she's too kind. Um, but uh, and it runs in Hamilton, Kitchener, Niagara, um, Guelph, Burlington, and Oakville right now. Uh, and yeah, so myself and we have one other employee, Jay. He probably is just getting home from running the Oakville program this evening. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have an excellent volunteer who runs the Niagara program every other week. So I get to stay home on windy, wet, wet and cold nights like that. So Niagara is running tonight and all our other programs start this week. There's, yeah, thanks, Patrick. Great for that. Uh, the ARC program is literally the most successful kids running program in North America. I have not <laughs> heard of anything like this. 
it's an incredible success story. Uh, if you know, or if, if you've got kids, what, what age is it for Patrick? Uh, it's, so the main adventure running kids program is ages six to 12. We do run a program for teens as well. This is for people like Emma who got into it, who were in adventure running kids, but then wanted to become orienteers. Uh, and just for teens who just enjoyed it and want to keep running. Um, and that's, but that runs in Hamilton, uh, officially Hamilton, Burlington and uh, Kitchener. Uh, it actually sort of unofficially runs as well. There's a group of kids who've graduated from ARC who still run in an informal ARX group in Niagara on uh, Thursday nights as well. Great. And it's, uh, it was built similar to the Jackrabbit program, if yes. you know that from skiing. And its whole goal is to create people ranging from the Bob Millers of the world to the Jenny Andersons of the world to the Emma Waddingtons. That it's, the Everyone. goal is to get kids to really have fun outside. So if you'd like to find out more about that, then reach out to the Don't Get Lost Club. Yes. And uh, there's still yeah. spaces to sign up as well. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> ne <laughs> Next slide. We'll go on to, I believe, stars. And uh, we'll circle. Actually, yeah, we'll quickly cover this. Uh, April 29th, this is the new uh, Don't Get Lost uh, Satellite Club in South Georgia, Georgian Bay area. Uh, and we'll have more on this uh, later on, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Stars, Laura, you still there? I am. Great. Quickly so on this. I, I'm here to talk about Stars Orienteering Club. We're a small but mighty orienteering club based in Kitchener, uh, Waterloo and Cambridge. Uh, we have three at the moment annual races, um, a winter adventure race that happens typically in February, usually in the Wasega Beach area. We have to chase the snow <laughs> north. Um, and then we have two Oak Cup races that are held on the same day. So Kickstart is the afternoon race and Starry Night is a night orienteering race. I think it might be one of the only ones in the province. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so that's a lot of fun and it gives everyone a great chance to get up on the Oak Cup. Uh, uh, standings, as I talked about earlier. Uh, we also have, as Patrick mentioned, we also host uh, the Kitchener, uh, the Kitchener iteration of the ARC program and their monthly training nights also often, usually in Kitchener and Waterloo. Um, and I think that's it for us. Oh, and I wanted to mention that pre-pandemic, we used to have a mountain bike race, a mountain bike orienteering race, as well as a urban adventure race. So maybe when those will make a, a resurgence before long. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, next, actually, we're going to turn to Barbara from Toronto Orient Touring Club. Hi, um, so I'm, I'm Barbara from Toronto Orient Touring. Um, we kind of serve the, the city of Toronto and kind of the very near GTA. Um, we're very recreation friendly. Um, we put on the weekend races as well as um, a lot of um, kind of weeknight um, training courses in the, around the city parks. Um, so our next uh, event that's open to everyone is gonna be on June 4th. It's our annual mob match, which is um, a kind of scramble style event where you kind of collect as many uh, control points as you want in a time limit. So it's a, it's very kind of recreation friendly, but it is um, it will be at Eldritch King um, Forest, which is a, a proper forest event um, outside of the city. Um, there's a, an, another annual event that's finally coming back this year after the COVID closures, which is our annual school meet, um, which is basically an opportunity for different um, schools to bring their students um, pretty much anywhere from, let's say, like 12 and under a little bit to all through the youth kind of categories. Um, and we do a really big event, you know, for hundreds of students. Um, they usually go around in little teams or or pairs um, and yeah and then do a big kind of a full day of competition actually that was my my very first ever um, uh, orienteering competition was uh, the TOC school meet back in 1996 I want to say something like that um, so basically if you if you're a teacher or if you have um, or if you know of teachers or maybe um, you'd want your kid to um, to participate in something like that, um, then reach out to us um, and hopefully we can we can slot you into that. So it'll be May 17th that's coming up. Um, and then also starting in May, um, May 10th and going right to the end of August, we have, as I said, um, during the summer, we do training sessions on weeknights, um, once a week on Wednesdays. Um, around the city parks. So this is very, very accessible um, in terms of, you know, usually accessible by TTC. 
um, accessible also to new orienteers. So if you're really kind of nervous about maybe going out into a weekend forest event, which is um, a lot of what's been getting talked about so far, um, we also have uh, these park events that are effectively, you know, let's say something like High Park or Sunnybrook Park. We kind of try to do full city coverage, like we can go to Mor Morningside Park or um, what the, one of the North York parks or Etobicoke, so we're kind of all over. Like each week, we we rotate the different parks, and um, and it's just a, a much easier venue to get started in orienteering. Um, if you're nervous about going out into the forest and getting too lost, <laughs> um, if you get a little lost in in the park, you're not gonna you know you're gonna find yourself pretty quick. So um, yeah, those are our Wednesday night orienteering, and it's it's yeah very inexpensive. We're free if you're a member, and that runs all summer throughout the parks. Um, and then finally, um, kind of in the in the fall season, uh, we have our annual turkey trot, which is which is September twenty fourth, and that's another weekend event um, that's out in the woods. Uh, so, and usually that one we'll do in a more classic orienteering style. So, um, so uh, you know, with with a uh, with all the timing equipment and everything like that. So. Um, yeah, and then as Laura mentioned, we, we participate in the winter series again, but that's that's not going to start up again until the following winter. Um, and then additionally to that, another um, aspect of, our, of us trying to kind of get new orienteers into the sport, uh, we also run, just like DGL, I guess, um, we run uh, beginner clinics throughout the summer. So usually we try every couple of weeks um, to get a beginner clinic on, so it'll be like an hour and a half to two hours of getting the basics of um, how to read an orienteering map, how to use your compass, how to sort of recognize the different features in the train, um, just get your kind of basic toolkit that you need for orienteering. And then at the end of the season, at the end of, let's say like in the fall, um, we'll try to do an intermediate clinic where you might learn um, some more advanced skills like how, how to avoid getting lost, how to get yourself out of getting lost, how to do some um, techniques for um, just getting from point A to point B more efficiently and using some sort of like uh, tools out in the train. Um, so yeah, we're TOC, we're uh, torontoorienteering.com and uh, yeah, we, we try to be as kind of open and welcoming to new orienteers as we can be. Excellent. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, and now turn the floor over to, or keep heading east and turn the floor over to Ricard uh, Anderson, uh, President of Orienteering Ottawa. Ricard, you have a whole bunch of slides. We don't have a lot of time, so uh, please pick uh, the most important stuff here, please. Thank you. So yeah, we're orienteering Ottawa. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to highlight the kind of events we do uh, this spring. Uh, so we have basically every Sunday through April and May and, and into June, we run uh, one event in uh, on the Sunday. Uh, we offer novice, intermediate, short and long advanced courses. And on all of these, there's usually a, a very simple introduction to orienteering. So if you're completely new, you're welcome to come out and there will be some an experienced orienteer that can give you an, an introduction. Uh, next, please. Following the uh, spring series, we have a uh, summer solstice series during June, which is a mass start score orienteering. So you take as many controls as you can in an hour. Uh, we haven't finalized uh, locations yet, but they are usually in the, the city parks or, or in, in the actual city of Ottawa or Gatineau. Next, please. Uh, June 2nd to 4th, we have a training camp at Foley Mountain, uh, which is uh, a bit south of Ottawa, and there will be training all weekend, and on the Sunday, there's a, a regular Sunday event for anyone who wants to join us. Next, please. And our big event for the year is the, the Ottawa O-Fest, which is on the 5th to 7th of August. There's a middle and a long and a knockout sprint. It shouldn't say spring, it should say sprint event. Um, and there's more information on, on our website. And as mentioned earlier, this is kind of in uh, cooperation or coordination with the, um, the Canadian Orienteering Championship, which is in uh, Montreal the following weekend. So there's an entire uh, week and a bit of orienteering to be had going from Ottawa and up to Montreal that week. And in addition, during the fall, we also have a standard, um, we have a spring uh, summer sprint series of events with short uh, urban sprints in the city and we have a fall series with uh, more traditional um, forest running as well. Uh, during the spring we're also running a learn to program which is uh, a training program for uh, for anyone who wants to learn to orienteer. Um, and uh, 
there's an information session tomorrow uh, for anyone who's interested, but you don't need to attend the information session to, to attend the program. Next, please. And that was pretty much it. Go to our website to see all the details. And that's ottawaoc.ca. Excellent. You. Thank you so much, Ricard. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the Ottawa Club is, has an incredible, impressive uh, set of races and a just event. And they are uh, one of Canada's biggest, biggest clubs and just a really great um, level of quality of events uh, and really embracing the, the train they have in the, the National Capital area there. Uh, and they also, I think, I, between Ottawa, I don't think Ottawa or, or Toronto mentioned it, but uh, 2024 is going to be a really big year because uh, we're hosting uh, the North American Orienteering Champs and the Canadian Orienteering Champs in Ontario. And uh, this is going to be a big thing to, that the two clubs are going to be working together gearing up on that. Okay, thank you clubs. Uh, if anyone has any questions, check out their website. Uh, and if you're if you're living in an area without one of those clubs, then please reach out to Orienteering Ontario. Uh, we'll give you some advice in terms of what's closest. Uh, we would really love to see more clubs in Ontario. Uh, we need to have a critical core uh, number of volunteers in one area um, in order to build a new club. But it's something that's certainly on our radar. So please reach out. Uh, I wanted to cover quickly a few Orienteering Ontario updates. Uh, events like this uh, webinar is put on by our great volunteer board, uh, and we're really looking for more people who uh, may want to step up uh, to help with some individual projects. This is a list of some of the activities that uh, we've been working on, um, helping develop and uh, some of the, and helping develop the uh, you know the broader growth of both adventure racing and orienteering. Wanted to especially flag the landowner relations. This is an issue in terms of land access and especially off trail access uh, in parks that is becoming more and more of a challenge. Um, it's our belief that you know, parks are meant to be run through or, or, and the woods can be run through uh, without lasting any kind of lasting environmental damage. Um, we need to really stress this to officials and looking for people to help uh, do this. So we're looking for people with environmental science background, but also communications background uh, to put some presentations together. So if that's an area of interest, uh, please reach out. Also really looking to help develop the next generation of mappers, I think is really important. Uh, Bob and Jen talk quite a bit in terms of the importance of maps, the importance of updated modern maps that, uh, that, that are way better to race with. Uh, it's important for us that we develop the next generation of that. So uh, with that, we have pretty much come to the end. Any kind of big picture or any sort of questions uh, you have for um, those of us on the board or anything about adventure racing or orienteering, and uh, we can ask that or else, as I said, welcome to reach out anytime. And I think... Otherwise, I'll just start asking uh, uh, Patrick Sale more questions. Ricard, maybe I'll put you on the spot. You're uh, from Sweden originally, and you did orienteering growing up, and now you've come back into the sport recently. What what got you back into the sport? Well, I moved to Canada and was looking for something fun to do, and I realized there was an orienteering club, so I went out to an event, met a fellow Swede, and uh, stayed with it. Excellent. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we've heard Ricard there uh, and Patrick Sale from Australia here. Certainly I've orienteered around the world, which is a, a great sport and also around Canada as well. Um, you know, we, we have stressed uh, kind of the recreational, the training element of it. But if, if people are wanting to get better, then uh, it's certainly opportunities for that. I think we are just looking at the questions here. Uh, oh, great question from uh, Kevin in terms of helping with uh, mapping. Uh, Matt Barrett, uh, who's on the Ontario board, leads our little mapping group. Uh, basically, reach out to Orienteering Ontario and uh, we'll help connect you. 
Um, out of Ottawa, Jeff Teutsch is training, uh, has, a little, has, a, has a company that teaches mapping. Um, and also, I think a lot of people who have gotten into mapping, um, updating, uh, updating the existing map is usually the best way of getting into that. Uh, certainly nowadays with LiDAR technology and that sort of thing, it's much easier than it, it was historically. But uh, I think more than anything, just like navigating, uh, trial and error is the best way of, of starting. I think mapping, uh, just getting out there and doing that and having, uh, having a good mentor to work with you, uh, I think is really important as well. Okay, yeah, Kevin, reach out to Orienteer in Ontario. We'll, uh, we will chat. Any other uh, last questions here? Oh, uh, briefly, Barb, or no, um, Amber on uh, running the deck, can you go back to that don't get lost slide? Uh, and in uh, the end of April and the event in Georgian Bay. There we go. I just, oh, one more. Uh, nope, going the other way. The last don't get lost slide, there we go. Wanted to flag uh, new in in for Don't Get Lost and uh, in a newish region in Ontario. Uh, event at the end of April, the Lori Forest Spring Adventure Run that uh, in the Collingwood area. This is a offshoot of Don't Get Lost in the South Georgian area. And uh, really great to see expansion and events up there. And I think the woods are gonna be in awesome shape at the end of April. Um, highly recommend this as a way of kicking off and really excited to, to have more orienteering going on in that part of the province. Okay, um, let's see, any questions we haven't gotten going? Uh, from Ben, um, I'm just looking at the questions here. Uh, oh, okay. Kate. Uh, for Ben in the Ottawa area, looking at organizing an adventure race, I would reach out to Ottawa and they'll have a good idea in terms of maps and resources. Ottawa has been really challenged with access to Gatineau Park. This is an off trail issue, um, but the Ottawa club will know uh, quite well in terms of what's out there, uh, maps available and that sort of thing. Certainly it's, I find, um, you know, Bob mentioned Often in adventure racing, they're using one to fifties and one to 20,000 scale maps, which are really tricky to navigate. I would think if you're organizing an event, you'd want the best maps possible. Often those are with the orienteering club or something like it. So uh, definitely recommend reaching out to that. Uh, let's see, any other comments? Okay. Um, I think that's great. Uh, the drone uh, technology, I am not a mapper, but certainly mapping has had a real revolution with LiDAR technology and satellite imagery. Uh, and if you want to reach out and talk to someone who is a mapper, they can talk a long time uh, about LiDAR technology and the impact that that has had uh, to be, be being able to create maps, um, as well as using actually Google Map and being able to do a lot of the research or the field work from someone's desk versus being out in the field. Uh, but, you know, I certainly would think it, the a combination of that is uh, most important. Uh, with that, would like to uh, wrap things up. Wanted to flag uh, Mike Waddington's talk about navigation in April, Emma Waddington's chat in terms of uh, memory and navigation in May. And more than anything, the next events that are gonna be in the woods, uh, check out the clubs and hope to see you out there. So with that, thank you to uh, all the members of the Orienteering Ontario Board uh, for their help here. And uh, if you have any further questions or comments, please send them our way. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.